Okay, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and we're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through the book of 1 John. And last time we finished up chapter 4, so today we get to start in chapter 5, the last chapter. I'm kind of excited. I'm hoping we can get through this quickly. And I've thoroughly enjoyed this study. I hope you have as well. And so, for sake of time, I went ahead and wrote up here everything that uh, I wanted to talk about. And I'll probably draw some more up here as well, but I figured we'd go ahead and have it up here. Because chapter 5 is basically a summary of what we've already looked at. So he writes everything, and then he rewrites everything he just said. He kind of repeats himself. <laughs> but I think that's important as well, because what he's giving us is some very, very, very important information, and it doesn't hurt to repeat yourself when you're giving the truth. Amen? But what we're going to do today is start out with a review of what we have already seen. And I want to remind you that the book of 1 John is an epistle. An epistle is basically a letter. And it's interesting, it's the correspondence of the early church. And so that's why in chapter 1 we saw the word if and the word we so much. Because they wrote to him and they were like, John, what if this? John, what if that? What do, what do we do if this happens? John, if, if. And so John is writing back, well, if this, then this. If this, then this. So we clearly see that, and we see how it's a letter. It's a writing back to those that have questioned him, some questions. Exactly like a lot of the epistles of Paul. So chapter 1 is the if and the we, and it talks about the blood, and it talks about forgiveness. Now, we've got to remember what I told you, okay? And I hope you understood this already, but we've looked at it. That the early church started with the apostles that were at the time called the disciples of Christ. And the early part was Jesus' ministry. In Jesus' ministry, here he is. And then the apostles came out here and were preaching to the Jews. But the Jews rejected their Messiah. So God said, okay, Paul, come here. And God gave us the apostle Paul because the Jews rejected their Messiah. And Paul's epistles are the heart of New Testament doctrine. Because the Jews rejected their Messiah, God gave a bunch of revelations to the Apostle Paul. And uh, some of those revelations weren't given to the other apostles. So they got together with Paul, and they said, Oh, you mean God showed you this? Oh, you mean God showed you that? Oh, you mean God gave... And so whenever we read the New Testament, we have to make sure that it lines up with the Apostle Paul. Because Paul tells us in Romans chapter 11, verse 13, that he is the Apostle to the Gentiles. So... I told you from the beginning that as we go through here, we're going to see where does he line up with Paul. Because everything needs to go by what Paul says, because Paul was given what he was given, the information, the doctrine, the revelations of Jesus Christ given to Paul for us today because the Jews rejected their Messiah. You see, the kingdom message was the message that Jesus came preaching. And this over here is the kingdom. Well, had the Jews accepted their Messiah, then the kingdom could have been back then. But because they rejected the Messiah, then God goes, okay, we're going to do it like this. And so God had to give Paul some things that are for us today, and that's where we get our doctrine from. So when we go to 1 John, we have to go, okay, now where does he line up with Paul? And I told you before, there are some people out there that we call hyper-dispensationalists who say things like, well, John isn't Paul, so we don't ever read 1 John. And I think that's kind of detrimental, because what we have been seeing, as we're reviewing right now, is that John lines up with Paul a lot. And he shows us the blood. You can't go one chapter without him mentioning the blood of Jesus, and he shows us about forgiveness. Chapter 2, he talks about know and written. And it's all about some things you need to know and the things that are written down, and he talks about the propitiation. Well, Paul talks about propitiation, Romans 3.25. Verse 19 of chapter 2, he talks about some people that went out from them, that might have been with them for a little while, but they were not of them. So there were lost people pretending to be Christians who left. Who were those? Well, we know those today as the Gnostics. And so, who were the Gnostics? Well, Paul warned us. He said, watch out, after my time, grievous wolves will come in. <laughs> and we see, oh, well, that's who he's talking about, these Gnostics. And as we continue in chapter 2, we look at the unction of the Spirit. Well, when we're saved, according to Paul, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. So that must be what he's talking about. And then verse 29, being born, getting the new birth. When Paul talked about being saved and being born of the Spirit when you're saved, and how you are begotten through the gospel, the new birth. And so in chapter 3, we see he talks a lot about love and life. 
eternal life. And he starts out the first two verses talking about the sons of God being begotten. Well, like I said, that, that lines up with Paul, begotten through the gospel. Verse 3 talks about the hope. Well, Paul talks about that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, and that hope is the rapture. Verse 14, we clearly see the doctrine of eternal security. Verse 23 talks about belief, and then in verse 24, Pauline doctrine, Jesus dwells in the believer. What does that mean? Uh, when you're saved, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, something that was revealed to Paul, that when we're saved, Ephesians 1.13, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Then we moved on to chapter 4, and we looked at verses 1 and 2 in chapter 4, and how it's about the deity of Christ, and how there are these evil spirits that will come and attack the doctrine that Jesus Christ is come, not has come, is come in the flesh. And we looked at how new versions of the Bible, they can't even pass the little test given here of whether or not a spirit is of God or not. New versions cannot say Jesus is come in the flesh. They say has come. Why would they change that? That's interesting. So the deity of Jesus Christ, we see the difference between truth and error and knowing and loving. The importance of knowing something and loving one another. And we looked at how there's the spirit of error as well. Then we see in verse 4 how he is in you. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. Well, that's the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. That's indwelling Holy Spirit. That's Pauline doctrine. Christ dwells in us, verse 12. Paul Pauline doctrine. Verse 17, he talks about judgment. Well, that would line up with the judgment seat of Christ. So, this is what we have seen so far. And so far, he has lined up so much with Paul that I do not understand how anyone could say something so outrageously silly as, we should never read 1 John because it's not for us today. <laughs> or, it doesn't line up with Paul so we can't read it. And I'm just going, well, have you read it? Because we've gone through it verse by verse and I can't help but see it line up with Paul in many places. So why do they say that? Well, today we're going to get into why they say that, because remember the difference between the preaching of the who and the what? When Jesus showed up, it was all about who he was. Believe in who he is. Believe in the name. And even in the early book of Acts. Then God told Paul, Paul, look, it's justification by faith. It's what I did to justify you. You're not justified by the works of the law. You're justified by faith. And so the message today is to trust what Jesus did. Now, the who message is great, but the who message isn't what saves us. But it doesn't hurt to know who Jesus is. He is God, and I put this up here, a review of who John says that, that Jesus is. We'll look at that here in a second. But over here in the tribulation... As soon as the rapture takes place, then God goes back to dealing with the Jews, and here's the message of who Jesus is again. And the Jews need to re receive that message that Jesus Christ is their Messiah. So there's a couple places in 1 John where he's, he's clearly telling us the message of what Jesus did, but he's going back and saying, now believe who he is. And you look at that and you go, but that's so back before Paul. Why would he say that? Well, we looked at the reason there must be a dual application of the book, kind of like we looked at a dual application of the book of First Peter and Second Peter. And so it, it can apply during the tribulation. After the rapture, Jews will read First John and go, oh, okay, and they'll apply it a lot to themselves in that dispensation. So I've always taught a dual application of the book of First John. Now, with that stated, what we're going to get into is the summary of what we've already looked at. So I wanted to put it up here. But I want you to also see who is Jesus Christ. If you've done our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through the epistles of Paul, and that's what I recommend, I hope you've done those first because, again, that is the heart of New Testament doctrine. Then we can do other verse-by-verses and see what lines up with Paul. Well, if you do that, you realize that the book of Hebrews was written by Paul. No doubt about it. A lot of people say, no, he didn't write it. But it's clearly, it's clearly Paul's message because the whole first, what is it, seven, eight chapters is all who Jesus is. And then the rest of the book is, now let me show you what Jesus did for you. He was your Messiah, he was your Christ, he was your King, and he is the sacrifice, and he is the author of eternal salvation. So the message of the book of Hebrews from Paul is the who and the what message. And the who, so you believe who Jesus was, and then he says, now this is how you're saved, trust in what he did for you. Okay. So I see in John a lot of the who message, but also some of the what message. So what I want you to see is as we've gone through so far the first four chapters, who he is saying that Jesus is. John 1.1, 1, 1, he says Jesus is the Word. John 1.2, he says Jesus is eternal life. 
One three, he says Jesus is the Son. One five, he calls Jesus the Light. One nine, he tells us that Jesus is forgiveness. Well, that's definitely the what message. You know, the beginning of this is the who message. But what did he do? He did what he did on the cross to forgive us. And what did he do? He shed his blood for our sins. And you cannot leave out the blood. And I don't see John leaving out the blood. I see the message of the blood in 1 John 1, 7. Uh, 2, 1 John 1.7. 1 John 2, 1. Jesus Christ is our advocate. We have an advocate with the Father. 2.2. 2, propitiation. Pauline word. <laughs> Matter of fact, he uses it twice. He uses it in 4.10, I believe, as well, if I remember correctly. In 2.28... He speaks of Jesus as he's coming back. He will return. Uh, let me read that real quick. Um, 1 John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him as his coming. So Jesus is returning. And when would that be? For us at the rapture. Now, in 2, 29, Jesus is righteous. That reminds me of Paul. <laughs> that reminds me of Peter, even. The just for the unjust. Jesus is the just. 3.8, it talks about Jesus Christ as the destroyer of um, the works of the devil, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus is going to destroy the works of the devil. Well, that would be at Armageddon when he comes back and defeats the Antichrist. Uh, sacrifice, 3.16, 3, Jesus Christ is the sacrifice there because it says he laid down his life for the brethren because Jesus laid down his life for us. So we see Jesus laying down his life for us as a sacrifice for our sins. In 4.2, we see Jesus is God. In 4.8 and 4.16, God is love. So Jesus is love. And in 4.14, Jesus is portrayed as the Savior because what did he do? Well, in verse 14, um, we pass from life unto death. So what did he do? He saved us. He gave us salvation. Now in chapter 5, we're going to see a little bit more of the who message. And this is who Jesus is. He is the overcomer, and we overcome because he overcame, 5-4. Five, 5-7, five, he is part of the Godhead. And we're going to look at the doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity. We're going to look at Jesus in 5-11 as life. He is life, life eternal, eternal life. He is the provider, verse 14 and 15 of chapter 5. 5-20, five, I look at that as the teacher because in verse 20 it says, and hath given us an understanding. Well, the, the, the thing is, God gave us the Bible to know and to read and understand, so the Bible is our teacher, and it's the Spirit of Christ, so Christ is teaching us when we read the Bible. And then finally, verse 20, He is God, and He is eternal life. So there's our review. <laughs> we've gone, oh, what, 13 minutes so far, and all we did was review what we've already seen in 1 John. And for the life of me, I do not understand how anyone could say, don't read 1 John, it's not for us today, it doesn't line up with Paul. When all I'm seeing is, it's lining up with Paul, and it's Pauline doctrine. Now the thing that is a little confusing though, is when he gets into this chapter and tells you about who Jesus is and believing in who he is. So he's preaching both messages at once. Why? Because the rapture is supposed to come. And he was probably thinking in his day, like Paul. Paul thought, in my day, the rapture is coming. He says, then we which are alive and remain. So he was probably thinking, you know, the rapture could come anytime. And then when we all go up, will there be other people that come to Christ in the tribulation? So I better remind them of who Jesus is. So I think that's why he's writing and sealing this up this way. So 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1. Here is basically a summary of what we have already seen in the first four chapters. But it's not wrong to repeat yourself. So it's good that he does that as he finishes this book. And remember, this book, my Bible note here says it's written in 90 AD. I think it was probably after that. I think the book of Revelation was written about 95 to 100 AD. So this was probably written after that. But it begins, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now wait a minute. Is that the message of salvation today? Believe Jesus is the Christ? That's what we find in the early ministry of Jesus and the early ministry of the book of Acts of the apostles. They were going to Jews, so this was all for the Jews, and they were telling the Jews, hey, he's your Christ, your Messiah has come, because what is the Christ? The Christ is the Messiah. So here we see the Christ, the Messiah. So this is message to Jews. Well, 
the Jews rejected their Messiah, so God is dealing more with Gentiles today, but Jews can get saved as well. But just as soon as the rapture takes place, then God goes back to dealing with the nation of Israel, and then this message is, hey Israel, hey Jews, get on the bandwagon and realize that Jesus is the Christ. Because you guys missed it almost 2,000 years ago. Come to your Messiah. And that's what they're looking for now, is their Messiah. So he starts out the summary of the book going back to the who message. Why didn't he stick with the what message? I think he had a heart for both Jews and Gentiles. And I think he wanted them to both see the same thing. So whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Well, literally, whoever was believing that Jesus was the Christ here, they got born again. And then they came over to Paul, and then they realized, oh yeah, Paul says to believe in what Jesus did. But if you um, came to Jesus before you met Paul, and you believed, did you become part of the body of Christ? I believe so, and we've looked at that. Some people say, the body of Christ doesn't start until Paul. Uh, okay, so what about all these people before Paul? Well, that's your hyper-dispensationalists. They say, they're not saved. They're not part of a body of us. And yet Paul says there were people that were in Christ before him. What does that mean? In the body before him. So the body starts with Jesus. It's called the body of Christ, not called the body of Paul. But there were people that got into the body before Paul by believing in who Jesus was. You see that? Now we get into the body of Christ by trusting in what Jesus did. So at the time of this writing, there's nothing wrong with what he said. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God because those who got saved believing who Jesus was, they're part of the body of Christ. But it's more believing what Jesus did today, not just who he is. So it's kind of an interesting thing. So verse 1 here tells us to believe and to love. So here's verse 1, and verse 1 starts out here, to believe something and to love. That's interesting. Well, he just keeps going back over love, 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 love. But what happens when you believe? You get eternal life. So love and life, I guess, would sum up the book of 1 John. Believe in what he did. Now, look down at verse 4 real quick. Verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Faith in what? Well, verse 6, there's the blood. But verse 5, believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So do you see in chapter 5, the little bit of a conundrum we get into? He's teaching the who message, but he's also teaching the what message. And he's going back and forth. So my wife and I were talking about this not too long ago, the other day. And uh, my wife said, you know, honey, it doesn't hurt to preach the who message. But what saves us clearly today is the message of what Jesus did. You're saved by trusting in the blood, through faith in his blood. Trust what he did. But it doesn't hurt to preach who he is. And I thought, yeah, that's great. I mean, it doesn't hurt. People need to know who Jesus is. Now, that's not what saves them. You're not saved by just believing that Jesus is the Christ, okay? Now, in the tribulation, that'll be part of it. But it doesn't hurt to know that. Now, if you're a Gentile, though, what do you care? You're like, Christ, what is that? <laughs> See, the Jews have the Old Testament, and it said there's a promised seed coming. And all throughout the Old Testament, they're reading it, and it's talking about the anointed one, the Christ, who's coming. And they viewed him as their coming king, because a king was usually anointed with oil on the head. But they were looking for that Christ, so they were looking for him, and they wanted to believe in who he was. And yet, they missed it. They missed, and they did not accept who Jesus was because he was their Messiah. So it's not wrong to tell people Jesus is God. Matter of fact, that's a good thing. But the gospel is what God did to save us, and how we're saved is by faith. So he does get it right. He does talk about faith. But he's mixing the two messages. Why would he do that? My thinking is because he knows that soon... The rapture will take place, then God will go back to dealing with the nation of Israel, just as Paul taught in Romans 11, and that then it's very important that they believe that Jesus is their Christ. So that's why I see very clearly the difference between the who message and the what message. But his emphasis here in chapter 5 is believing in who Jesus is, and I just find that strange. That's why it must have a double dual application. Because we're not saved today by just the who message. 
we're saved today by the message of what Jesus did. But I do see the what message here too as we get farther down. So can't wait to get into it. So verse 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. So believe in Jesus and love other Christians. This is this main message of this book that Jesus is eternal life. So when we are saved and we have eternal life, because we have Jesus and Jesus' is life, then in this life, love one another. Because God loved us enough that he gave his life for us, that now that we have eternal life, now we should also show forth love as Jesus showed love. So I find that interesting. Now I'll skip down to verse 2. Verse 2 says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Now, some people, they love to nitpick and just take a verse here and take a verse there and take a verse here. And they do that. And they'll go to verse 24 of chapter 3. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelt in him and he in them. And they'll take it out of context and see it's by keeping the commandments that we're indwelt. And so they believe that it's by works that we get the Holy Spirit and we get saved. And Paul's like, no. I received ye the Spirit by the keeping of the law? No. You receive the Spirit by faith. So... They'll nitpick and they'll go to a verse like this and they say this, For this is the love of God, verse 3, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. And then verse 2, But this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. And they say, See, the whole book is all about keeping the commandments of God, and, and it's back under Jesus' ministry, keeping Jesus' commandments. What? No. Jesus gave a lot of commandments to Paul and to Peter and to John. And so when he's talking about keeping the commandments, he's talking about the commandments of the apostles in this dispensation. He's not saying, forget Paul and go back under the ministry of Jesus. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, let's keep the commandments of God, okay? The commandments of God are through the apostles and through Paul for us today. That's what he's talking about. But he's not saying that you keep the commandments to get saved. What he's saying is we keep these commandments because we are saved. Because we are saved. Now back to verse 2. He says, by this we know that we love the children of God. Who are the children of God? Well, let's go to Galatians chapter 3. When we get saved, we become children of God. We become born again, and we become sons of God. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, look what it says. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So when we get saved, Paul said that the saved are children of God. So I am a child of God. What does that mean? That means I'm a son of God. Did Paul ever say you become a son of God? Why, yes, begotten you through the gospel. Unto my son Timothy. Um, he said we're born of the Spirit. There's a lot of places where Paul talks about being begotten um, or being born again. Now, he doesn't use the term born again, those two words together, but he talks about being born of the Spirit, begotten by the gospel. And here says, through faith, we become the children of God. What does that mean? Well, we're sons of God. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in what? And walk in love, verse 2. As Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. That sounds a lot like the book of 1 John. Uh, get saved, and then love one another. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Let's go back to Romans chapter 8. So I want to preach this to you correctly. Now, if I remember correctly in our old Bible school that I went to, they did not teach 1 John verse by verse. And uh, I always wondered why. And it was always, well, it, it's a hard book to, to know. It's a hard book to understand. Well, I just approached it, if it lines up with Paul, then it's for us. And as we've gone verse by verse through this, I've been studying myself. I just see lines up with the doctrine of Paul. So I don't see a problem with 1 John. I don't know why they didn't teach us verse by verse through 1 John in our Bible Institute. But I'm glad that I'm able to do that with you here now. And I'm seeing that it lines up with Paul. Now Romans chapter 8 verse 16 and 17, Paul says this, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now verse 21. Because the creature itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now let's flip over to Romans 9.26. 9.26. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Now this is what? Verse 24 of the Gentiles. 
Because the Jews rejected their Messiah, God said, I'm going to take salvation to the Gentiles. And today, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, if you will by faith trust in what Jesus did for you, trust his blood, then you will be a child of God, a son of God, through faith in what Jesus did. So that's what the Bible teaches there. And the question I have is, how can you be a, a child without a birth? <laughs> How can you be a child of God if there is no new birth? You know, there's some people out there that they'll say, there's no such thing as born again. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, okay, I, I just, I still can't fathom how someone could say that, you know, in the Bible, born again doesn't apply to the church age. But I have heard some, now not all, but I've heard some uh, hyper dispensationalists teach that born again is the nation of Israel gets born again. Or born again applies to them out there. No, born again is the spiritual birth that takes place when we are saved. And it is a spiritual birth. And Paul says it in Corinthians. I can't remember if it's 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 4. Let's look at it. Let's look at it. I want to make sure. I, I know I gave it to you on a other teaching, but I want to make sure we have it here. 1 Corinthians 4, 15. 4, 15. 1 Corinthians 4.15. 4, 15. For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So some sort of a birth took place through the gospel. And that spiritual birth is you being born again. And that is through the gospel. So the preaching of the gospel is what saves us. And the gospel, what is it? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And that's the gospel of what Jesus did to save us. And salvation through faith or believing in what he did. Okay? So, let's go back to John chapter 3. I forgot when we looked at born again to go to John chapter 3. And I wanted to go there and talk about this. So we need to do that. Let's go to John chapter 3. And let me show you about being born again. Now, some of your hyper dispensationalists, and again, they're, they're all so different. Some teach the same thing, some don't. But they all have one thing in common. They all think that Paul was the first one in the body of Christ. Well, it, no, because the body of Christ is just that, the body of Christ. It's Christ's body, and the blood that he shed started the New Covenant, the New Testament, and that blood started the church. And he, he bought his bride, purchased with their own blood. So anyone that got saved after he died is in the body of Christ, according to the Bible. But some of these hyperdispensationalists say we don't believe in the doctrine of born again because they say because it's found over there in John chapter 3. Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are before Jesus dies, until he dies in those books. So many things that are taking place in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are things that are taking place in the Old Testament still. But John is very, very, very different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There are a lot of things recorded in John's gospel that aren't recorded in the other three. And it's all about believing to get eternal life, believing to get eternal life. So I, my thought on this is, if you'll remember, John was the youngest of the disciples. And at the Last Supper, he was leaning upon Jesus' breast. So imagine him as, as anywhere between maybe 12 to 18, I don't know. But he was the younger of the disciples of Christ, and he was always closest to Jesus. He was like, you know, if you had a little little boy that's following you around, like you're, I don't know if you've ever done the little brother program, you know, where you're a big brother and the little guy looks up to you as the big brother. Well, that's what was going on there. John was looking up to Jesus like his big brother. And so John was always following Jesus, and I wonder if Jesus wasn't, uh, here's all the other apostles, if Jesus goes, hey, John, blah, 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 blah. And so a lot of the stuff that's written in the book of John, the reason that it's not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is because Jesus was saying it to John, and, and saying, now in the future, after, <laughs> then you can write that and write down these things that I told you. Because there's a lot of things in the book of John that is not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now I have a video on YouTube entitled, How the Gospels Portray Jesus. And I think you'll find that interesting. So John is very different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And a lot of things are recorded in John that are not recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And like I say, I personally think they were given to John because Jesus knew the future, and Jesus wanted John to know, now in the future, this is how it's going to be. And John remembered those things and wrote them down. So John chapter 3, and verse 1, we see a thing happening here, in which a man, one of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, came to Jesus by night. 
And Jesus says this to him in, in verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of people will stop right there, and they'll say, So what this is, they say you must be born of water and the Spirit. And remember, though, this is Jesus speaking before he died. But he's clearly speaking about out here during this time period where we're saved by faith. But he says, except you're born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God or see the kingdom of God. And some people today will say, so that water is water baptism. So you have to be baptized in the water. Is that what it's saying there? Actually, no, because the rest that I didn't read, let's look at it, it defines what the water is. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So there is a fleshly birth, the birth of your flesh, and there is a spiritual birth, the birth of your spirit. What do you think that is? Well, that's the first birth, and that's the second birth. And the first birth is a carnal birth. It, this is when you're born. The first birth is the birth of your flesh. When your mommy's carrying you, you're inside of a sack of water in her belly when she's pregnant. And then she says one day at about nine months, Oh, my water broke. And out comes the baby shortly thereafter. It is a water birth. So the first birth, the natural birth, the natural man, a first time when we're actually born into this world, we are born of water. It's not talking about water baptism. It's talking about the water that you're in when you're born and your mother's water breaks. But the first birth is no good because we're born in a fallen state with a fallen nature. And because of sin, we will die someday. So we must be born again. And that is the second birth. And Jesus clearly defines that as the birth of the Spirit. So being born again is a spiritual birth. And how some of these hyper-dispensationalists can say, it's not for us today, I don't understand. Because Paul talks about born of the Spirit. So he must be talking about being born again spiritually just what Jesus is talking about here. Now, Jesus said it way back here, right? But he knew in the future what was going to happen, and he knew out here during this time that we need to be born again. So some say water and spirit, verse 5, well, that's water baptism and spirit baptism, and that is not what it's saying. It's saying first, before anybody can get saved, they got to be born. And when you're born, your mother's water breaks, you come out of the womb, and the womb is where the water is. Now, now you're born in the world, good for you, but you're still lost. Now you need to be born again to get to heaven. And that's what Jesus is saying. So today, it's not water baptism that saves us. Uh, some people believe that. There's a church out there called the Church of Christ, and they teach that heresy. They teach that water baptism is essential for salvation. I don't believe that because that's not what the Bible says. If you get a chance, look up my YouTube video entitled, Is Water Baptism Essential for Salvation? And you'll see that we're not saved by water baptism. And I'll give you all the verses, but let me just go quickly here today and just give you some verses real quick to prove that it's not water that saves us. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It's the blood that saves us. So there is a spiritual baptism that takes place when we get saved, and that's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it happens the moment we believe, not like the Pentecostals teach. Well, you get saved, but then you get the baptism of the Spirit later. That's not what the Bible teaches. When we get saved... We get the Holy Spirit, and we're sealed, Ephesians 1.13. So 1 Corinthians 12.13 says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles. You mean, you mean the body of Christ, that one body, is both Jew and Gentile? Yeah, yeah, that's what the Bible teaches. So these people that believed who Jesus was in the early book of Acts, they are part of the same body of us today who believe in what Jesus did. That's what it's saying. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we Jews or Gentiles, whether we bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So this is what we call spirit baptism. Now, let me go back to Acts chapter 1. There are people today that will teach that water baptism saves you. And I do not believe that, because that is obviously not what Jesus was saying in John chapter 3. And yet they pervert it. They try to go there and say, so water and spirit. So you've got to get baptized in the water, and when you're baptized in water, then you get the spirit. That's what they teach. 
But that's teaching something because they don't rightly divide. They're teaching something in which they're twisting the scriptures to teach what they do not. Let me show you this. Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. Jesus Christ shows up. And in verse 5, Jesus says this, For John truly baptized with water. So this is John the Baptist, all right? John the Baptist shows up and announces to the world who Jesus is. And he, he it comes six months before, and then Jesus starts his ministry. But John baptized Jesus. So because John showed up baptizing in water, a lot of people say, so baptism in water is still for today, and you've got to do it. Well, not for salvation, all right? Now, you can be baptized in water after you're saved, but water baptism is not what saves you. But they teach, no, no, water baptism saves you. Okay, then let's look at Jesus, and let's see for ourselves if the Bible teaches that. Acts 1.5 says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So John the Baptist did water baptism, but Jesus, before he goes up to heaven, he says, now there's another baptism. John did this, but this is what's going to happen. And it's spirit baptism, baptized with the Holy Ghost. All right, now turn over to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Many of your church of Christ will go to Acts 2.38. And it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And they say, So water baptism is what gives you the spirit baptism. And when you're baptized in water, then you get the Holy Spirit. And you look at that and you go, have, have, d d What are you, huh? The book of Acts is a transitional book. This is in the very beginning of Acts when it's still to Jews. The Jews reject their Messiah right after this, a couple of chapters later. And then the rest of the book is all about how, well, now we're going to Gentiles. And it's different than water baptism to receive the Spirit. It's receiving the Holy Spirit through faith alone, not the water that gives you the Spirit. So there's a change that takes place. And if you look at the passage here, look who is speaking. Verse 36, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Verse 37, men and brethren. Look at verse uh, 22. Ye men of Israel. Uh, it's all about Israel. And then they're saying, Mother, brother, what shall we do? Verse 37. So the Jews realized we killed our Messiah. What do we do? The answer was get baptized in water and get the Holy Spirit. And that's what they did then. And that was the message of who Jesus is. Believe that Jesus is the Messiah. In the name of Jesus. All right. So the who message all goes back to the name of Jesus. And it's more like a Jewish thing. But as you continue reading through the book of Acts, let me show you something. Let me show you this. This is amazing. Acts chapter 10 and verse 44. All right, Acts chapter 7, God gives the Jews one final chance. And Stephen stands up and preaches to them, and, and Stephen is stoned. The Jews kill him and say, we don't want this Christ. And the Bible says he looks up and sees Jesus in heaven standing on the right hand of God, like he could have come back then and set up his kingdom. In chapter 7, they kill Stephen. Chapter 9, we see Paul saved and called of God. Chapter 10, we see some of the first Gentiles hearing the gospel. And who preaches it to them? Peter. In Acts chapter 10, look at verse 44. Actually, 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So, receiving forgiveness through believing in his name, it's still, it hasn't quite gone over to the message of Paul and what it is. It's still believe in his name. And then it says here in verse 44, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. So they got the Holy Spirit when they believed, not through the water baptism. So something changed between chapter 2 and chapter 10. Now, in chapter 11, Peter retells what happens. And you know what he says? He says, oh, oh, Acts 1.5, what Jesus said. John baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So Peter realized, oh, that was back then, the water. And, and John showed up, water baptism. A lot of the early apostles, they went around baptizing people. In Acts 2.38, water baptism. But then he realized, oh, oh. There's another baptism. I think I'll make it purple because purple. And it's the purple baptism. It's the spirit baptism. Oh, so it's not the water anymore. So look at the confession of Acts chapter 11 of what he says. Acts chapter 11. He's retelling what took place in chapter 10 when Cornelius got saved. And in Acts chapter 11, verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us as the beginning. 
No water baptism there. Now, after they got the Holy Spirit, they went and baptized in water, but they didn't have to do baptism in water to get the Holy Spirit. They got it when they believed. Then verse 16, Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And then on and on and on. So he remembers Acts 1.5, and he says, Oh, it's not the water that gives us the Holy Spirit. We're not baptized with water to get the baptism of the Spirit. Oh, it's the Spirit baptism that we get when we believe. And so he's retelling that. So as you go through Paul, here's what you find. Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. Acts 16, 30 says, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Acts 2, 38. Repent and believe and be baptized to receive the Holy Spirit. No, that's not what it says. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So, salvation is through believing. Not through dunking in water. You are not saved by dunking yourself in water. But yet there's some people out there that don't read their Bible. Many of them belong to what's called the Church of Christ. And they believe, well, Acts 2.38 is still for us today. And it's like, no, you haven't read the rest of the Bible. That was for a time when the Jews were still ready for their Messiah to come. But because the Jews rejected their Messiah, God said, okay, the spirit baptism is what you get when you believe. It's through faith that you receive the Holy Spirit baptism. It's not through water. So there is a change that takes place in the book of Acts. And it's clearly written in the Bible. Let me show you the Apostle Paul. Here's what Apostle Paul says about water baptism. And he does not teach that water baptism saves you, like some people do. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. Paul, the Apostle, the greatest missionary that ever lived. Look what he says, verse 14. 1 Corinthians 1, 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. <laughs> If you're saved by water baptism, then why on earth would Paul say, well, I thank God I didn't baptize anybody else? Wouldn't he be saying, I don't want anybody else to get saved? I thank God that those people didn't get saved. Wouldn't that be what he was saying, if water baptism saves you? Yeah. Skip down there in verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize in water, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. So it's the preaching of the cross and believing in the other liquid, the blood, that saves us. So it's not the water that saves. We are not saved by water baptism. But yet there are people out there that say, oh yes we are. Well they are not rightly dividing the word of truth. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It doesn't say, and water baptism is what saves us. Now what they'll do is they'll say, well, we'll go over to, to 1 Peter uh, uh, 3.21. Well, there it is. Okay, let's go to 1 Peter 3.21, because 1 Peter 3.21 does not tell you that water baptism saves you. Matter of fact, it tells you the opposite, that you're not saved by water baptism. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 now, new versions of the Bible take out the first part of this. And new versions of the Bible say, now baptism doesn't even save us, or something like that. And you look at that and go, so you're saying that we're saved by water baptism? Now, that's not what the King James Bible says. Somebody took some words out to try to teach water baptism saves. And that's not what the true Bible teaches. Look at what the true Bible teaches. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. So there is a figure of baptism. But look what he says, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what is water baptism today? After you're saved, you can be baptized in water. And what you're doing, you're not doing it to get saved. Many churches say, we want you to be a member of our church, but we won't accept you unless you do water baptism. Because you are doing a figure of as Christ died and was buried and rose again, you are saying, I identify with him who died and buried and rose again for me. And you're not doing it to get saved. You're doing it as a testimony of, yeah, I am saved. And so that's how they teach this verse. So I do not see this verse saying, yeah, water baptism saves you. That's not what it says. It says water baptism is a figure of something that does save. What saves us? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what the gospel is. 1 Corinthians 51 through 4. How that Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And salvation is through faith in that death, burial, and resurrection. Faith in the blood atonement of Christ. So salvation today is not through water baptism. It's through faith in the blood of Jesus. When we are saved, 
we are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 4 through 5 says there is one faith, one Lord, one baptism. So there is one baptism. What is that one baptism? That is spirit baptism. So today, when we get saved, we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've shown you the verses. Now, I wish I had time to get more into that. There's other verses I could go into as well. But I say that because I want to go back over here to 1 John chapter 5. And in 1 John chapter 5, it mentions water in verse 6. And verse 8. And some people will try to go here and say, so see, it's water baptism, and you've got to be baptized in water to be saved. That is not what my Bible teaches. John came baptizing in water. The baptism is more of like a kingdom thing. Who is Jesus Christ? He is the king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But as the king, he came. And you know you don't go before a king dirty. If someone was coming to your house that was a dignitary, let's say someone called you up and said, the king is coming to visit you. I don't know why, but he said he wants to visit you. And you're out working all day, and you come in all sweaty and nasty and filthy. Would you greet the king like that and say, hey, king, I'm all stinky, but how are you? I'd shake his hand. No, you'd run inside and take a shower, put on your best clothes, and try it. Okay, now come on in, king. So John the Baptist came baptizing water, saying, hey, here comes the Messiah, the king. Get clean. So water baptism is more about that over there. And I firmly believe that during the tribulation, there'll be a lot of water baptizing again. Just like over here in the early part of Acts. Now, will they get the Holy Spirit and keep the Holy Spirit during that time? Now, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't see much of, of eternal security and sealing with the Holy Spirit during the tribulation because it says endure to the end. But I do see that over here, the message that was here in the early book of Acts goes back to what it was in the early book of Acts. But right now, our message is we're saved by faith alone in the blood of Christ. What he did. So back to 1 John chapter 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that believe, that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So if you know you're saved, then love other Christians and do right. And then what's well, one of the ways you know you're saved? Because the Holy Spirit in you is helping you to love others. Verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. So this is... Oh man, there's so much here to get into. I don't know if I have time to. But verse 4 says this. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So he is saying what Paul is saying, that it is faith that saves us, not water baptism. So anybody that tries to go to these passages and say it's water baptism that saves, they're twisting what the Bible teaches. Jesus said when he rose again, all right, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with a different baptism, not any days hence, and that's the baptism of the Spirit. And if you read through the book of Acts, you realize, wow, it's not the water baptism that saves. It's through faith that we get saved, and then we receive the Holy Spirit. So water does nothing for you. Now, many of you are hyper-dispensationalists. They do not believe in water baptism at all. And they teach that water baptism is not for this age. And that's why. And you know, they, they have a pretty strong argument. Because Paul, you don't see Paul baptizing very many people. And he even said, I came not to baptize. So I'm not a big proponent of water baptism myself. Because I'm a missionary. And I don't have to worry about it. Now, when you're a pastor, well, a lot of times you start a church. And part of the constitution of the church is to receive as, as a member someone. You've got to baptize them in water. And that's something that we did in Honduras and other things. But I'm, to, as a preacher right now and an evangelist, I'm more interested in are you saved or not than are you baptized or not. But I get people from time to time, Brother Brader, I got saved watching your videos. I'd like to be baptized. What do I do? And I say, well, you know, find a good church, a good Bible-believing, King James Bible-believing church. And sometimes they find some. Sometimes they don't. If you can't, well, watch me, okay? But if you can... Then uh, that church says, well, we want you to be a member, but we ask you to get baptized in water. Now, they're not saying, so you can get saved. No, they're saying, if you claim to be saved and you are trusting in the blood of Christ and you are saved, we would like you to do that because that's you in front of the congregation saying, I identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And then we'll accept you as a member of this church. And a lot of people have told me, Brother Rick, I got saved. I found a good bible believing church, got baptized, now I'm a member. I said, well, amen. So, I, you know, to me, I'm not going to preach water baptism is not for this age, but I am going to preach water baptism does not save us, because that's what the Bible teaches. 
Now, if other people want to get baptized in water, as long as they don't think that's part of their salvation, it doesn't bother me. Okay, But I don't want to go to the extreme that a hyperdispensationalist does, but I also don't want to go to the other extreme. I, want to, I don't want to be an extremist. Does that make sense to you? So to me, it makes no difference if you're baptized in water or not. What makes a difference to me is, are you saved? Now, if you are saved and you found a good church that preaches right and, preaches, and you want to join that church, there's no problem with being baptized in water as long as you know it doesn't save you. But like I said, that's something that I don't have to worry about being an evangelist, so it's not something that I have to do often. But uh, water baptism, a lot of people can go to an extreme on that teaching. And a lot of people think that water baptism saves you. I'll give you a quick um, story, a couple of them real quick, and I guess we'll close here. <laughs> I guess we'll have to close. But um, in Honduras, um, I was with another church, and they had gone into a village, got a lot of people saved, and were starting a church. And those that got saved came to be baptized in water, and then they were going to join the church. And the church asked, you can't be a member of our church unless you've been baptized in water as a testimony that you identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so they were baptizing some people. They asked me to. I helped do a couple of baptisms. And then the, this woman comes up, and she was all excited. She's like, I just saw my mom get baptized. I want to be baptized too. And I said, well, are you saved? And she says, not yet, but when you baptize me, I will be. I said, whoa, hold on. I said, so you think that's what's going to get you to heaven is if I dunk you? She said, yeah. I said, I'm not going to do it. And I had to take her to the Bible and show her how to be saved first and how salvation is not through that, it's through trusting Christ. And I don't think she got it. I don't think she understood. I don't think she believed and she didn't get baptized because we told her, we're not going to baptize you if you think that this is what saves you. And that's what she was thinking. She was thinking that the baptism itself, well, that would be a work. What you do is a work. And the Bible says we're not saved by what we do. We're saved by trusting in what Jesus did. So if you believe that water baptism saves you, then you're saying that Jesus, what he did on the cross, is meaningless because I can do this over here and get saved, and I don't need that. No, you need to trust that because it's what he did that saves us, not what you do. So water baptism does not save. I'll give you another story real quick. When I was younger, uh, I got saved at 18 years old, and I'd go surfing a lot with my friends. And uh, we met a guy one time that was a Church of Christ, and he believed that water baptism saved. And we'd be out there sitting there on our surfboards waiting for waves. And I talked to him about it. And I talked to him till I was blue in the face. And he still thought that water baptism saves. And so one day I looked over and I see, look over there, there's a surfer right there. I said, do you want him to go to hell? He goes, no, I don't want anyone to go to hell. I want them all to get water baptized. I said, then go over there right now, grab them by the hair, because he had long hair. I said, dunk them underwater and then say, you're saved, and then paddle away and see what happens. <laughs> he said, no, I can't do that. I said, you truly believe that water baptism saves? Yeah. Well, then go over there, grab them by the hair, and go, boom, you're saved. And I just joke with him about that, but it, he really believed that water baptism saved. And I said, well, then you're a hypocrite. You're going to let that guy go to hell because you believe he can be saved by being dunked, and you won't go dunk him. And he's like, shut up, man, leave me alone, leave me alone. I said, you need to rethink your teaching. Because if water saves us, then the blood is meaningless. <laughs> but we're about to find out as we get into this chapter that the blood is not meaningless. The blood is the witness. As we get down there in verse 6 and 7 and 8 and 9. So the blood is what saves us. We are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. As it says at the beginning of this book, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Water gets your flesh wet. The blood is applied to the soul and washes your sins away. So water does not forgive. Okay, Water does not save us. A lot more verses here that I wanted to give. But uh, back to verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So how do we overcome this world and get to heaven? Does it say it's through water baptism? No. It says it's through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you are thinking that water baptism saves you, then you are thinking your work is what gets you to heaven. That's not what it says. What helps us overcome this world is faith. Well, a lot of people say, well, I have faith, but their faith is in their baptism. So they're trusting in what they did. That's not salvation. The salvation is through trusting in what Jesus did, trusting the gospel. Ephesians 1, 13, quickly. Let me show you this. So my heart goes out to anybody who belongs to a church of Christ who thinks that water baptism saves you. They're lost. 
because they're trusting in their baptism rather than trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ. And they need to be saved. That is a cult, that, uh, that sect that teaches water baptism. And it shows that they haven't read the whole Bible. Otherwise, they would see the change from Acts 2.38 to Acts 16.30. And they would see why it changed. It went from Jews to Gentiles. Ephesians um, 1.13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. To get sealed with the Holy Spirit, to get baptized with the Holy Spirit, what do you need? You need to hear the gospel and then believe. Trust the gospel. So it's not the water baptism that saves us. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. And it's just so sad to me to see people uh, in cults like that. Over the years, I've gotten many phone calls from people that say, Brother Brecker, I used to be Church of Christ, and I thought my water baptism saved me. And uh, I appreciate your preaching because you showed me it's not the baptism. It's faith in the blood. And I got saved, and I got out of that cult. And I said, praise the Lord. And many of them tell me the same thing. I asked them this just to ask. I said, well, what, what did you do when you sinned? Did you ever, like, do a really bad sin after you were baptized? Yeah, yeah, man, I did this or I did that. I said, what did you do? They, I went to my church and I told them I did a horrible sin and I feel horrible. And they told me, get baptized again. <laughs> I said, how many times have you been baptized? One guy goes, three times. Another guy told me, he said, I was baptized seven times in my life in that cult, thinking that each time I got baptized, that would forgive me of my sins. I said, well, that's kind of a, a cult there, isn't it? I mean, how many baptisms do you need? What if you sin every day? Do you need to be baptized every day? It's, it's just ridiculous to believe that water can save you when that would be a work that you do. No, only the blood of Jesus can save you, and he said it's through believing or through faith. Look at Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. That washing of regeneration, that's God washing us, washing our soul clean from our sins in his blood. That's not an outward washing of baptism in water which was shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord, that being justified by His grace, we should be heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Then in verse 8 talks about, now do good works. After we're saved, we be careful to do good works. Well, that sounds like what we're reading here in 1 John. After you get saved, why well, you keep the commandments? Because you want to do right. Because you want to live right. So, 1 John chapter 5, and verse 1 through 4, we've just read, and verse 4 ends with what? Even our faith. So faith is the victory. And we overcome the world through faith. And so it's by faith that we're saved. So I guess we'll stop there. Next time we'll start in verse 5. And uh, hopefully get a little bit farther on. <laughs> I wanted to get a little farther today. But uh, next time we'll start there in verse 5. And I hope you understand what we studied today. What we studied today... The review is all about knowing what's written down, knowing the truth and not error, and loving one another, and knowing the love of Christ. The love of Christ is Jesus shedding his blood on Calvary for our sins, and it's the blood that saves, and it's what Jesus did that saves. And so our faith that overcomes, that gets us to heaven, overcomes the world, is faith in that blood. It is not faith in water baptism. No, because water doesn't save us. And so it's the blood of Christ that saves us. And there are so many hymns. I just think of hymns. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. You ever heard that hymn? There's so many hymns in our hymn book. I've got a hymn book here someplace. They're all about Jesus and through faith and, and, and salvation and we get eternal life. And it's not through water baptism, it's through the blood. I've not found one song in the hymn book that says, Water saves, water saves. It's not there. So it's not water baptism that saves us. But there's many songs about Jesus saves. And Jesus saves, Jesus saves. That's a great one. So I want you to know that. I want you to get this right. And we'll go in next time into uh, what it talks about the Trinity doctrine. Can't wait to get into that. So thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. And I got into a lot of stuff here, but I hope it's been a blessing. And I hope your faith is in the blood of Jesus. If it is, share that faith with other people and tell them, come to Christ and come to what he did. And trust the blood for the forgiveness of your sins. All right. See you next time.
Bye-bye.